I guess my producer is doing it. Does somebody have two tabs open? Here we go. All right. Does somebody have two tabs open? Here we go. All right. Hold on. Are we back yet, y'all? <laughs> All right, guys, I think we are back. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Building the Black Educator Pipeline. I am your host, Shana Terrell. Welcome, welcome, welcome. As always, Helen from the South South Bronx. Um, that's who raised me, but of course, these Philadelphia streets made me, y'all. Educated activists out here fighting for freedom and liberation for our people always. So I want to thank you guys. It's always coming back for another week. Shout out to my co-conspirators who are always out there watching and supporting us week after week. We love you and we appreciate you. So today's show, we will be talking about freedom schools and building the Black Educator Pipeline. And today is a call to action. What are you doing this Freedom Summer? What are you doing to elevate the community this summer? I know what I'm doing, and I'm doing it because Freedom Summer is here. So today, we will be talking about the Freedom School way and how to build the next generations of leaders and activists. So please comment, like, and share. But right now, you can comment right in the chat by telling us, what are you doing this Freedom Summer? What are you doing to answer this call to action? So today, I would like to welcome two awesome guests to the show. So y'all already know our resident guest, Baba Dr. Carr. Dr. Carr is an expert in legacy of Black education and the co-founder of Philadelphia Freedom Schools Movement. Dr. Carr currently serves as the Associate Professor of Afro-American Studies and Adjunct Professor at Howard Law and the Department of Chair and Department Chair of African Studies at Howard University. Dr. Carr led the creation of African-American history curriculum now required by all Philadelphia youth within the public school system. He also serves as the city of Philadelphia's first resident scholar of race and culture in 1999. Dr. Carr has dedicated his career to black history and education through scholarly work, lecturing around the world and media features, which include BBC, NPR, and CNN. He is also the co-host of his own YouTube series, In Class with Carr. So make sure y'all are checking that out. My second guest, um, well, I don't know what to say. This brother is my brother from another mother and father, okay? He was born and raised in Northwest Philadelphia. Northwest Philadelphia. Councilman Isaiah Thomas is the third youngest of nine children of a Philadelphia school teacher and child care provider. Through Sankofa Freedom Academy, Lincoln University, and Thomas and Woods Foundation, Thomas has put the success of young people at the forefront of his work. 
whether in the classroom, on the basketball court, or in City Hall. He believes that education opportunities and coalition building is the way to make Philadelphia that the way that sorry, the way to make Philadelphia work for all of us. Councilman Thomas has a nonprofit, government, and private sector experience, which allows him to hear multiple sides of an issue and receive input from a variety of stakeholders. He has helped young people get the best education possible, provided out of school time programming, strengthen communities of color, and work to improve civic education across the city. Councilman Thomas, in his freshman year of council, was named chair of the Streets Committee and vice chair of Children and Youth Committee. He also sits on pro appropriations, disabled persons with special needs, education, creative economy, le legislative oversight, parks and recreation, public health, public safety, and technology committees. These committee roles and legislation he has passed highlight Councilman, Tom Councilman Thomas' vision to make Philadelphia work better for every family. Whether addressing gun violence, providing pandemic relief, or making the city government more transparent, Thomas believes in government that works for people and improves the basic quality of life for all. A proud graduate of Philadelphia Public Schools, Councilman Thomas has a Bachelor of Arts from Penn State and a Master's of Education from Lincoln University, the oldest degree granted historically Black college in the nation. He still actively coaches basketball at Sankofa Freedom Academy and is the president of the Coaches Association. Thomas lives in Oak Lane with his wife, Clissa, and two sons, Isaiah Jr. and Isaac. So please welcome to the show, Baba Dr. Carr and Councilman Isaiah Thomas. Welcome, y'all. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to yes. be here in your presence. Yes, we are excited that you are here. Shout out to you. I mean, all the great work that you are doing, okay? That bio kind of like took my breath away. So, like, literally. I was wondering. So, shout wanted, out to you. I don't know. They need a prize. I thought it was you, Shana. I didn't see. I I didn't, it you. Listen, bro, I didn't even know you did all that. So, I didn't I didn't write that. Um, how you spending your time on all of those committees? I had I had no clue. And then being an excellent father and a role model and example, example as a great coach. So, shout out to you, brother. Thank you. Shout out to you. I appreciate you. it. And I'll tell you one thing that's not in that bio that I'm extremely excited about. Um, I was recently uh, placed on the board for the African American Museum. Uh, oh! So excited to, uh, I haven't announced it yet. We will eventually. Uh, we're just in budget and stuff like that. But I'm excited to to begin to work on their board and to work with the African American Museum uh, to just, you know, do the great work that we already do. So whatever suggestions or recommendations, you know, y'all let me know. And, and, and I'm going to do the work y'all tell me to do. So it's another hat to wear and hopefully another uh, uh ally for the work that we, we we all love to do so much man brother yes. that's music Yo, shout right. out shout out that's <laughs> and music, the, fact the grand announcement was right here on the show yes yes <laughs> yes hey congratulations brother Thank councilman you. hey from all for all y'all around the world who are watching this who tune in and watch Shana, let's let's be very clear about this the museum in philadelphia and the museum in wilberforce these are two of the oldest. They both opened in 1976. So when you think about the museum, the Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture, you know, Councilman Thomas has just been uh, been appointed to serve as custodian for one of the anchor. That That is the parent, along with the Charles Wright Museum in Detroit, the DuSable Museum in Chicago, but the African American History Muse and Culture Museums of Philadelphia and uh, Wilberforce, Ohio, those are the two pillars on which the Smithsonian is built. They both came into mm -hmm. existence in 1976. Brother, you just, man, that brings a little, makes my eyes a little wider to think about. My man, Charles Bloxon, uh, had a hand yes. in getting that together. So, man, come on, man, come on, come on. Now you're talking about Charles Bowser. You're talking about, oh, my God. You, you're talking about the heroes of Philadelphia got that museum open, brother. Your name on that? I'm feeling pretty good today, Shana. We can just talk yes. about it. <laughs> <laughs> Sam good. Evans, are we talking about, look, I don't even want to start. Man. Listen, we got many, many reasons Man. to feel good. And like I said, shout out to you, Councilman Thomas. Uh, many reasons to feel yeah. good. But yeah. one of the reasons I brought y'all here today is because we all know, y'all, it is Freedom Summer. Freedom Summer. This is where we get to work at. Um, so I would love, Dr. Carr, if you could start us off with a little bit of history about Freedom Summer and its significance and why it's so important in our community. I'm going to say a quick word because, as we know, uh, 
our brother councilman thomas one of the ways he can do all these things is that he can do these things on parallel tracks so he and his staff are advocating for us as we speak so if you need me to uh if you needed to, to jump out councilman if you want to jump in to move things around please let me let us know because i'm not going to talk long about this um as you said shana when when i when i started working in philadelphia for the school district um of philadelphia in 1998 uh, the following year, we went to a partnership with the Children's Defense Fund out of D.C. to become a site for the Children's Defense Fund's Freedom Schools, which was a revival of the Freedom Schools project of 1964 in uh, in Mississippi. Uh, this was connected with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And we could talk more about that you know, later. But make a long story short, that first year, we opened seven Freedom School sites in partnership with the School District of Philadelphia and, and the uh, Children's Defense Fund. And our brother was one of the pioneer Freedom School students um, at that time coming out of Frankfurt High School with his crew, joining up with all those other young people. Kevin White out of Ben Franklin High School, Nadira Suleiman. I think she was a Germantown. I mean, so all these young people who are now uh, now full freedom fighters in all the spaces with families and children of their own i can't believe that man became the, became the pioneers no other city in the country had more than one freedom school with the children's defense fund philadelphia started with seven went to 14 went to 21 and every year we got bigger and bigger and it was all anchored in this question of intellectual work the concept mm -hmm. of freedom schools is based in this idea that classrooms are sites for raising consciousness as well as creating an uh, uh, enhancing capacity to read and write, to do math, to think about content and all these things. And so the long history of Freedom Summer uh, is really anchored in the idea of black self-determination and black education. That's what they were doing in 1964 in Mississippi with Storley Carmichael, Kwame Ture and others. That's what Lincoln University, Cheney University, the two oldest HBCUs in the country were doing. And that's what we do in Philadelphia Freedom Schools. And we can talk more about that later. But it's in the long arc of black self-determination and putting education at the center, which is another reason I'm so glad to have our brother here who is fighting to make that real, not just in summer, but year round for our young people in the city of Philadelphia. And Zeke, you are literally in the mix right now doing political work like as we are speaking, uh, you working. If you could just give us the significance of Freedom Summer and the political the political impact that has on black people. So when I think about this Freedom Summer, uh, if you're talking about the Freedom Summer of 1964, I mean, you're looking at um, one of the most influential eras of any lifetime. And I think that's important to say, because for us um, who, who, who consider ourselves historians who've studied this work, it kind of one of those things that goes without saying but as i begin to re-engage and talk to young people there's a whole nother wave of young people that we have to make sure that we're educating and educating the way where they're see receiving accurate and authentic uh historical context and so uh when i think about the summer of 1964 when i think about uh that freedom summer and the initiatives that took place to be able to get people registered to vote you know there's a direct correlation between that work that was done there the work we're doing now and the political work that I do every day on a consistent basis. Um, we recognize at that time that uh, the vote had a significant impact on the quality of life issues that black and brown people uh, were dealing with, um, the problems that they were dealing with on a consistent basis, whether you're talking about racial, whether you're talking about economic, or whether you're talking about another form of social justice. And if you look at where we are today compared to where we were in 1964, we still see similar problems as it relates to voter apathy, uh, people not necessarily believing in government, people feeling like um, nothing will change uh, based on the conditions that they're facing. And mm -hmm. so for us in the work that I try to do, specifically on a leaning more on the political side, it's imperative that when we do get these victories, uh, we, rec we, we recognize them and we show them the people on a consistent basis. I know this isn't necessarily a political dialogue, but when you talk about mm -hmm. the, the organizing and the voting um, efforts that took place in 2020, that's historic. Right. In 2044 and 2060, people are going to talk about the year 2020 and the organizing mm -hmm. effort that took place. Just like in 2021, we refer back to 1964. And mm -hmm. when you look at 2020, uh, not just the voting, right, voting effort that took place, we also have to look at the financial ramifications that have come come out of the uh, those uh, electoral outcomes. So uh, let me give you an example. Um, right now in the city of Philadelphia, we're looking to invest. Um, over $150 million um, in initiatives to be able to address gun violence in the city of Philadelphia, as well as prevention-based initiatives. We're going to vote on that budget in about five minutes. So if I go off screen, <laughs> that's what that's about. Yes, sir. But 
we would not have the means and mechanisms to be able to provide those type of resources if we did not have the win that we had in 2020 from the federal government. That's because right. as, a, as the truth is, we in most big cities across the country were, were facing deficits. We've seen uh, cuts that were unprecedented. We uh, can't collect tax revenue. Right. So for the young people who don't understand why cities are broke, cities are like businesses. Right. So just like businesses couldn't thrive, just like people were suffering, just like businesses needed a big bailout, cities need a big bailout, too. And the former administration was not uh, did not have the appetite to provide bailout dollars to cities, but they were more than happy to provide, you know, more bailout dollars to big businesses than what they actually needed. And so now that we have an opportunity to, to be bailed out similar to what those businesses were bailed out last year, it puts us in a position where we have flexibility on the dollars that we have right now, as well as the revenue that's coming in. And, it could, and, and as black legislators who care about black people who are unapologetic, about saying it right so as soon as i get off with y'all i'm gonna say the same black language right here in city council <laughs> yes sir. it puts us in a position where we can advocate and fight for resources in a way that we've never seen before so you know we're living in a time right now where we can where we're, we're seeing tangible examples of how organizing efforts in the 1960s specifically the summer of 64 were parallel to some of the organizing efforts that we've seen in the year 2020 and we're watching black folks reap the benefits now let me just mm. A lot of people, you know, from a philosophical perspective will say that um, we got it wrong in the 1960s. Right. Like they'll say that we probably should have uh, uh, stuck with more of a segregated mindset because let's take about talk about education for a second. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, a black child in the 1960s was probably more likely to see a black educator um, mm -hmm. in their face and teaching them, you know, from the perspective of somebody who looks like them and come from where they come from compared to what you'll see right now. Right. Like a, a, a young person growing up in the school district of Philadelphia. You're not very likely to see many black educators throughout the course of your academic experience. Correct. So the thing that has to happen with this moment is in the midst of making decisions on how we spend this money and how we allocate our resources, we have to get it right. We can't look back on 2020 and say, oh, instead of investing in gun violence prevention, we should have invested in infrastructure. Right. Or, or instead of investing in, in the infrastructure in our schools, we should have invested in. Uh, the future of, of employment and employment opportunities. We have to get this moment right. And in order for us to assure that we get this moment right, and I'm going to stop right here, the level of advocacy that must take place from poor people and people of color has to be like we've never seen before. Mm -hmm. Right? The amount of money that we're getting is like we've never seen before. And I can tell you right now, people who are in charge of spending this money will spend the money based on the advocacy from the constituents that they're responsible for serving. Hmm. So if I wake up every day and I'm getting tons of emails from people saying fund freedom schools, put money in the education, put money in the black neighborhoods, it's going to be much more difficult for me to say no to that than if I don't hear from that demographic at all. So when we're talking about hmm. social action and advocacy and what needs to happen, I mean, the advocacy that happens right now will make a huge difference, probably a more of an impact than what we've seen in our lifetime on black communities, um, or, or we can get it wrong. And those dollars can be spent on providing tax breaks for businesses and um, investments in neighborhoods that's already gentrified. We have a choice and it's gonna be up to the people uh, as far as Philadelphia that will determine how those resources get allocated. So I'll stop right there. I know that was a lot, but I no. really want people to understand that what went on in the summer of 64, uh, Dr. Carr used to tell us all the time when we were uh, high school students, history repeats itself. And we're literally living in a moment right now where history is repeating itself from the summer of 1964 to what we've seen last year in 2020. And now the outcomes. Right. So when you talk about Voting Rights Act, um, when you talk about other legislation that came after the advocacy of summer 1964, I'm, I don't I'm not one of those who feel like we got it wrong. I'm one of those who actually feel like we got it right. But I want to get it right again. And, and yes. we're in that phase right now where the next two to five years can really dictate, determine and shape how black communities um, live in this country moving forward. Absolutely. Dope. Absolutely. Dope. So then what that Absolutely. brings me to, right, Dr. Carr, hearing what, um, what Isaiah said, how do we organize the people? on the ground, how do we get constituents um, in different places and different spaces to come together to advocate for what's needed and for what's right? Um, with disenfranchisement out there, with people not understanding how city government works, with people not knowing how to get organized, what are some of the lessons we can take from Freedom Summer 1964 to get folks together and get them educated and get them organized? 
Well, I think we just heard the answer. Um, political work, and I appreciate what our brother has just said. What Isaiah just said, he said, "Well, this isn't necessarily a political conversation, but of course, it always is. It always is. Exactly. Absolutely, our, our lives are political, and yeah. the answer to that question, Sister Shana, in, in many ways, is contained in the question. The first thing it requires is literally." being in community not on social media this is a great platform for raising consciousness awareness directing people to resources but in the end of the at the end of the day this is a people conversation organizing requires being with people there are two powers jonathan shell wrote a book many years ago called the unconquerable world and he says you know one power in the world is nuclear weapons another power in the world is the people of the world and we just heard our councilman say you know, the reason that politicians politicians uh, take action based on power yes. and whether they be a principal person who is deeply grounded, comes out of a community and a family of deep political commitments to community, has been through every stage of organizing and then finds his way into city council with our votes. People say voting doesn't matter. All you got to do is look at Isaiah Thomas to see that that's not true and yes. can advocate for us. But when we make it easier for him by surrounding him with those calls, with that, with those bodies in the street, alternatively, someone who is our open enemy. Yes. And who is who is beholden to special interests and lobbyists and all kind of capital and who has their own selfish interests will find it that much more difficult to move against the people if enough if enough of the people are organized. And so when we see the Freedom Schools of 1964, as Isaiah just said, you know, they sit not as uh, an independent entity. They are sitting as one of the tools, one of the tools for organizing a whole state to resist oppression. And they were pursuing the ballot. Did we get it right? Yes. Did we get it wrong? No, because at the center of that practice was the central tenet of organizing. And we know this from Freedom Schools. We read Charlie, Co uh, Charlie, uh, Charlie Cobb and Bob Moses' book, Radical Equations. Bob Moses came to visit us. Dave Dennis came and sat with us from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Sonia Sanchez, over the years, they've all been in community with us. John Churchville there in Philadelphia. And the central tenet, Charlie Cobb and Bob Moses always remind us is when you come into a community, you ask those people, what do you want? What do you need? And how can I be of service? As Ella Joe Baker, we got Ella Baker trainers in freedom schools. As Ella Baker says to us, the job of an organizer is to put herself, to put himself, to put themselves out of a job. In other words, I'm coming into this community to serve. So in the freedom schools in Philadelphia, I'm sorry, 1964, one of the things that they asked the people is, what do you need to know? What do you need to learn? Some of the young sisters were like, look, if we knew how to type, we could get jobs as receptionists. We could get jobs that were better paying. So one of the things they taught was typing in the freedom schools. <laughs> They're also teaching, let's interpret the Constitution. Why? Because they say you need to interpret it to register to vote. Okay, let's talk about power. Let's take the way you talk, write it on one side of the board, take the way they teach you a standard English on the other side of the board and begin to translate. Why? Not so that you think you're not right because of how you speak, but to show you that you're, the way you speak is absolutely legitimate and the way that this other way is just another way to say what you're saying. In other words, Freedom schools were at the center of empowerment. The mm -hmm. only thing I will mention is another sister who Freedom Schools drew from, the Citizenship Education Program with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, was the great Septa McClark out of South Carolina. One of our models, as we've talked about so many times, y'all talk about the center all the time. Septa McClark understood that political power is often uh, built not only on organizing, but once you have, have people together, by helping them understand how moving collectively will improve their lives. And education gives us the tools to understand those connections that Isaiah was talking about. And it, it's just hard work. It's unglamorous work. It's It can be tedious. It can be exhausting. But once you've done it, you get to the point and then we've got somebody like Isaiah Thomas who's in the room and then it clicks. Oh, this is one of the reasons we did it. Yeah. And it didn't just start at the election. It started five years ago. It started right. 10 years ago. It started 20 years ago. We've got to understand that this is incremental work. And the only way we win is to stay at it. Organizing is about staying at it. And I think that both of y'all pointed out some extremely key points. And for me, it's like, how can Freedom School serve as an example to organize, organize and educate not only Black children, but Black people? Because mm -hmm. uh, I think Freedom Schools is one of the most important things to come out of 1964. I know we talk about all the bills, all the political action, 
But like once that's done, right? Like that's done. What continues to repeat itself, what continues to grow, what can continue to expand is a school, a freedom school, a place to tr train children, a place to raise young activists, like that mm. opportunity um, that is there that will exist forever. So the concept of the and the design of a freedom school to me was so genius, right? Because once you have little people, right? Like we have Isaiah as a, as a high school student from Frankfurt, I mean, came from a great household, but maybe didn't know much about activism and organizing or being of servant leadership, right? And of service. You get into a space like freedom schools and they teach you to be of service, uh, which I think is extremely important. I know it was important for me. We get into these other spaces where folks are educating us and they're not educating me to be of service. Mm -hmm. So like you said, the job of an organizer is to put me out of business. Job in freedom schools is to educate young people so you can go out and be activists, so you yes. can go out and take your power. I mean, I think that's extremely important to point out about the Freedom Summer of 1964 and why freedom schools are extremely important. Um, Councilman, you want to speak to that? I, I agree 100%. Um, you know, and, and you know, in the midst of freedom schools, one of the things freedom schools always done is, is have a love for reading and, and taught a love for reading. And for me, you know, my story comes directly from my, my involvement in high school. I would never have been involved in politics had it not been for freedom schools, right? So I, I don't come from a family with a traditional political background. I was introduced to my first political job because of the work that I was doing in freedom schools. And that kind of started my journey, you know? Um, so without freedom schools, I, I would not be doing any of this political work that I'm doing. Um, my love for reading, right? That freedom schools really pushed that. Um, this idea of the reward for good work is more work. The, the first time that really resonated with me was on a conversation with Dr. Carl, Alex Henry Farm, when I was asking him if he thought I should be an Ella Baker trainer or not. And mm -hmm. that was his response, and I go on to be an Ella Baker trainer. So, yes, you know, indeed. I can think of a lot of, of uh, poignant mm -hmm. conversations, um, 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 pieces of information and influential things that have happened to put me in the position I'm in. The last thing I'll say um, as it relates to, 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 to this, this side of stuff and this level of advocacy you know, when we think about uh, freedom schools and we think about the work that's, that, that, that has been done and that will continue to do, um, in, my, in my mind and in my lifetime, I don't know a more influential program. And for us, um, when you're talking about freedom schools and making an initiative like the three, the coalition is also on the political side because the advocacy needs to be there for the dollars. And so during my first year and a half in council, I screamed at the top of my lungs, the city needs to fund freedom schools. And I mm. think for the first time, <laughs> I'm actually... Mm starting to resonate with some folks and, and and it's not about me right like this isn't like about getting me a check or uh improving my personal finances this is about the work that needs to be done and when you look at the gun violence and a lot of the problems that we see in the city of philadelphia if we had a freedom school with every zip code i'm 100 percent sure our city wouldn't be this bad the problem is, is that i'm the only one that believes it and you know yep. you need 12 votes uh, to be able to move things on council and i've been working my butt off to be able to do that but we still have a lot more work to do so what, what the advocacy is is imperative it, it's the difference between us being able to have this conversation or us not being able to have the conversation and i think that when you look at the work that's been done in the past we have a lot of victories and i'm very optimistic about uh, where we're headed towards the future mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. and you make, you make an excellent point just about you're the only one and i think that sometimes freedom school is just an experience that you have to see it to believe it um, and I just, sometimes that bothers me, right? Because it, it isn't a space for everybody. Everybody's not invited <laughs> into freedom school space, right? Mm -hmm. So, and you talk about people of other persuasions that just, that's not their space. Um, it's our but, space. But, but, they're, but they're impacted, but they're impacted. Shane, I should say something, Isaiah makes me think about this. Mm -hmm. Um, as you know, every year, now we're in our 21st year in Philadelphia, Philadelphia Freedom Schools has a social action project. And at its peak with 21 sites in every corner of the city, Philadelphia Freedom Schools in schools, in school district buildings, a school is the heart of a community. And so when we, when we hear our councilman speak, it reminds me that gun violence was a social uh, action uh thing we had at one point uh mm -hmm. we even one year we had the the our issue was no baseball stadium in chinatown it was really oh, about remember dispossession that. remember that right no question and one of your colleagues i'm thinking about helen gim long before she was on the city council parents and parents for she was involved in the parents group 
which was connected. And we had a freedom school at Bach. And that freedom school had black students, like Latinx students and Asian students because Asian Americans United was our partnership. Yes. Yep. And what I'm saying is that, you know, what Isaiah said is so powerful. What our council said is so powerful. I think part of the challenge we have is that we don't have the institutional memory. So when council members from South Philly or North Philly or some West Philly, council members, no, understand that freedom schools resonates in your community, walk the streets, ask the people, ask your voters, how many of them know about freedom schools and what you're gonna unearth is stories that we haven't necessarily collected yet. Yes. The case to be made for freedom schools is in those communities. Our social action work is clear. Stu I mean, in, in schools that aren't there anymore, like Charles Drew and University City High School, go all the way out to Northeast, whether it be Frankfurt, whether you start talking about whether it was Ben Franklin in North Philly, whether it be William Penn, it's not there anymore. Go to South Philly with Bach, go to Dobbins over there. Every place. And they were in elementary schools. Understand yeah. that. Demer Bieber Middle School. I mean, when you when you are if you're invested in your children, you understand our social action work was about making sure that our communities were safe for those children. And so, yeah, it is, it's all political. And the story of freedom schools in exactly. Philadelphia exactly. is sitting yeah. there in the communities waiting for those folk to say, wait, freedom schools? Oh yeah, I remember. For, yeah, in fact, that's how I went. Uh, that's how I decided I'm going to college. That's how I decided I was going to go and get my certificate. That's how I decided to, because thinking work, I'll, I'll end with this, thinking work shapes who we are and what we do with the skills we, we acquire. So freedom schools isn't just about, oh, let's learn some skills. No, freedom schools, as we just heard our councilman say, is about changing the way we think. And then once we change the way we think, we take our gifts and contribute them to the community. But it starts with how we think. That's what mm -hmm. we have to change. How we think and taking action. Um, and hey, you hit it right can on. Can I add something to that? Of course. I, um, I'll give you an example. So we've been in a lot of dialogue about Tulsa, Oklahoma. Right, uh, the burning um, was the book that I was introduced to that taught me about Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1921. So you know, it's a hundred year anniversary, and and a lot of the political dialogue, people are like, oh well, I don't know. It just turned into a thing where people was like, well, I either never heard of it, or where is the first time you heard it? So when Dr. Carr talk about this idea of how we teach and what we teach and teaching in a way that's empowering folks, I think that's a great example because a lot of people it started to turn into this trending thing, like. Where did you hear it or how did you learn about it? And for me, I'm like, wait, time out. How, how, how come people don't know about it? And, and about I had it. to kind of go back like, oh, my goodness, this is another example of something that's been entrenched in my mind because of the work of freedom schools that I think is the norm as yes. it relates to history. And then you look up and you're in this political dialogue with a lot of intelligent folks who've never been exposed to the information. Never. So it goes back to how we teach and what we teach, because when you're talking about people having some level of sympathy for the black fight, part of the problem is. They don't know everything we've been through. So when That's you're talking right. about Tulsa, for example, a lot of people say, oh, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Why can't black people be more, do more for themselves? Well, shoot, that's a great example of what we did do for ourselves. And, you know, folks burned down what we were trying to do. And if that's you don't know that, right, you don't have that contextual history, well, how can you really have an accurate perception on who black people are in America and what it is that we've been through? So the history and what we teach is important, not just to us, but to all people who walk this soil so they understand what it means to be a black person in America. So when we scream about these issues, you know, I, I don't know how often I'm the angry black man. Or I'm just, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to be that way. But when you think about our plight, how can I not be? And I just come to yes. accept it. Like, how can I not be? Either, either I'm angry or I'm complacent. And that's fine because I don't want to mm -hmm. be complacent mm -hmm. in the midst of the struggle and the things that we're going through. So I just wanted to just yeah. listen to Dr. Carter. I just I just wanted to kind of bring it out there because I bet other people in the professional spaces are going through the same thing. Like, well, how did you not know about that? Well, me, the only reason I know is because of freedom schools. Had I not done freedom schools, I have the same you know level of education as it relates to the black experiences here in America. But that's why that experience and you putting that out, even about Tulsa, is so important. But that brings us back to the the connection of this is all political. Because at the heart of freedom schools, educating children and adults is political education. Now, whether you're talking about from 1960, Freedom Summer 1964 or you're talking about the Black Panther Party, either one, it's all about political education. It's all about making people know what circumstances they're under, what circumstances they get, and how we get there to liberation and freedom. Because that's what this is all attached to. Um, so if people are not 
understanding that we're not roaming through the world just to roam through it. And as we talk about in earlier context of like this indoctrination of being American, no, our job right here, right now as black people is to fight for freedom and liberation. And all of that is connected to a political education. Would you not agree that? <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's all, no, no, absolutely. And you know, it's so, it's so funny thinking about this. And again, listen, listening, listening to uh, Isaiah, listening to you, you know, a couple of years ago before this COVID hit, um, but Isaiah pulled together some of his generation of elected representatives, not only in Pennsylvania, but other places at the Congressional Black Caucus um, meeting, the annual fall Congressional Black Caucus meeting. And I was so moved, impressed, inspired, and instructed by listening to you all in dialogue, because it also reveals that two things. Number one, we have to empower the people who will represent us in this fight for resources that we hear our councilman talking about. Mm -hmm. And the second thing, in other words, we have to register, we have to vote, we have to select out from among us the best of us to represent us in that space. That's why Isaiah is there. And the second thing, it really, really, really kind of not opened my eyes to as much as it, it reminded me and helped me understand, see that this next generation is prepared, is the depth of considered, well-reasoned, thoughtful dialogue that was coming from these young people who had clearly not only studied the issues, but knew why it was important and knew the historical context of the struggle that they're engaged in. So when I see Isaiah Thomas, I see Dave Richardson. Mm. You see what I'm saying? I mean, I see Roxanne Jones. I see those earlier generations, you know what I'm saying, right. in this space. But not only do I see that because I'm a student, I see it because of what comes out of his mouth. Let me know he was a student. And he's a now's yeah. my and that that cannot be understated. There are a lot of well-meaning people in political office who haven't studied the trajectory. So when they get into a space where somebody gonna flip the script on them, they may not know what to do because they don't know the last 15 times this happened. We exactly. have to be very careful about who we support. And when we got somebody we can support, we gotta go to the wall because yeah. this is literally life or death. Isaiah is right. This next two to five years is not only going to spell the direction of the city of Philadelphia and many cities around this country, it's going to spell whether it's going to be a United States or not because our open enemies have decided to drop all pretenses. They go into war in a way yeah. they haven't gone to war like war. this since the Civil War, since Agreed. the 1860s, not the 1960s. And if we're not careful, this whole thing's going to fracture. Yes. So with that, what do we think are some major issues that Black people should be organizing around this Freedom Summer in 2021? So what should be our focus Freedom Summer 2021? We know like in 1964, it was tons of stuff, but that voter registration was something that they harped on and literacy was another thing they harped on for children and for adults. But right now in 2021 Freedom Summer, what should be the focus for Black folks? Go ahead, Council, you working, man. You might be voting right now, is it? Yeah, yeah. I would um I would say I would say a couple of things. The first thing is um I, I honestly I think funding for schools. I think that's major. I think that uh, capital investment as far as infrastructure, technology, upgrading our spaces and facilities. Um we probably won't have uh, on a state level the amount of money that we have um anytime soon. Um I, I think that that's that that is a huge one because you're talking about something that's gonna impact generations. You do have some issues that are taking place around voter rights. I think that's extremely important as well, too. But look, you know, I, I, for us in Pennsylvania, uh, the gubernatorial race next year is, is major. And if you look at some of the things that state legislators are passing, right, if we do not have the right folks in place to be able to offer um, what we need as far as vetoes, some of these things will get passed into a law. I'll give you an example. There was a law that was passed in Pennsylvania, I believe out the House, uh, either the House or the Senate, I'm not sure which one, that basically would charge uh, women for if you have a miscarriage. Like you have to, reg you have to like uh, register your miscarriage, which is like traumatizing people all over again. So that's an example. And you saying they were trying to pass that. I don't even understand the sense in that. And again, why is your business? But <laughs> you're right. If we don't have the right people in place to advocate and be the voice for the voiceless, um, that's how these kind of things get out of hand and, and the power into a set group of people. But I, it's that's a bad bill. And, and at the end of the day, people know that the governor is going to veto it. But it's, they're, they're giving you a glimpse 
of That's what great. Harrisburg would look like and feel like and what Pennsylvania would look like and feel like if we do not have a Democrat because the, uh, the Republicans control the House and the Senate in Harrisburg right now. So without mm -hmm. a Democrat, especially during the Trump administration, you know, we could have seen all type of bad things happen to us. So again, infrastructure for schools, I think that's major. I think that's extremely important. Always, you know, the voter rights issues and voter access and uh, organizing people around voting. But then also, again, you know, that gubernatorial race next year, you know, remember, Freedom Schools was destroyed because of Corbett. That's right. right. That's what destroyed destroy Philadelphia Freedom Schools is Corbett. We don't want to go back to that. That's right. When you when you say that, oh, you probably still, I was going to say, explain to people when you say that is what it destroyed it. Um, because Dr. Carr just got finished saying how we were up to 21 sites, 21 sites, um, and got down to zero. And then the center we tried to come back and revive it along with the partnership of San Cofa Freedom Academy to keep that going. But how was funding just completely destroyed where people thought it was okay to take away out of school time and summer programming for children? I think Dr. Carr probably better to answer that because he was there the whole journey. And so <laughs> like how exactly how that stuff went with Governor Corbin. No, it's what you said, brother. It was it's politics. It was a city council uh, unwilling to invest those dollars. It was a state house to take over the schools, um, mm -hmm. budget cuts. You know, with all due respect to Easy Ed Rendell, the governor of Pennsylvania, at the time I remember when uh, John Street was the mayor and uh, David Hornbeck was superintendent of schools. And you saw budget cuts. And a lot of those cuts weren't just, you know, at the behest of a Democratic governor. You've got those. Uh, we call them conservatives, but they're not really conservatives. In many ways, they're white nationalists, hmm. uh, whether it be Western Pennsylvania, whether it be the middle of the state. They don't have any investment in human capital. They don't even have the investment in their own voters. They're, they're, they're moving against their own voters, but, but it's about political power. It's about lobbyists. And so those budgets get cut. And the superintendent of schools at the time, David Hornbeck, resigned mm -hmm. rather than execute those budget cuts. And Freedom Schools got caught in the crossfire. But what's important to remember is that because of that state takeover, which led to the School Reform Commission, of course, uh, we had school reform commissioners because, again, they get picked by the governor. You know, the mayor gets to gets to suggest we had champions on the school reform commission. Johnny Itazari, who worked for school just for many years, Sandra Dungy Glenn. And they were able to continue to filter trickles to freedom schools. And then, of course, with the charter school movement, what emerges out of that long struggle? Because, again, this isn't just about one size fits all. Political struggle means whatever tools you have available to you, you use them. A lot of mm -hmm. people are anti-charter school. I'm not anti-charter school. I'm like W.B. Du Bois. Du Bois said what the Negro wants is not segregated education. What the Negro wants is not integrated education. What the Negro wants is good education. So <laughs> we were able to get one of those charters for Sankofa Freedom Academy. That That's same right. Sankofa Freedom Academy where Coach Thomas coaches state championship level uh, basketball is the home was the home of freedom schools. It became it was the first in the country's first K-12 freedom school, public freedom mm -hmm. school, saying Cofa Freedom Academy. We continue our struggle. So I guess I, 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 I'll end with this. Those those things we should be organizing around this summer mm -hmm. you know, at the local level. It's all about infrastructure. It's all about funding from the schools. This uh, current federal administration, there's a crack. There's a window there. They're going to do it through budget reconciliation because you got two white nationalists, one from West Virginia and one from Arizona, mm -hmm. who are going to use the excuse of not blowing up the filibuster to give this country over to the white nationalist party, which has decided they're going to have majority minority white nationalist rule for as long as they can to the wheels fall off. Mm -hmm. But there's a crack through budget reconciliation to perhaps get some infrastructure money. And you know who knows what to do with it? Filled up your city council. Isaiah Thomas got something to say with it. That's something we got to organize around. At the federal level, it's absolutely about this voting rights fight because they're going to try now to take the vote and they're doing it at the state legislature level. Almost all the states are, are considering or passing voter suppression laws. And this For the People Act that died in the Senate the other day doesn't even be, doesn't even have a line in it to address what they've already done with this le with this legislation at the state level, which is take power away from secretaries of state, take power away from local election officials to supervise election. They're setting it up so they can steal an election in broad daylight. And Pennsylvania mm. is no different. Remember, Pennsylvania is the state where they went to court and basically said the Pennsylvania Supreme Court does not have the right to, to rule on state issues. And Samuel Alito, a white nationalist on the Supreme Court right now, was hot to get that before the Supreme Court, but he didn't have the votes. If you don't put a, a friendly administration in in Washington, D.C., 
They're going to spin it stack in that court. And if you think it's bad now, Isaiah is right. This next two to five years might be for the whole ball of wax. Might be for the whole ball of wax. Don't think what happens in D.C. doesn't affect what happens in Philly because it runs through Harrisburg. Please understand the role of state government. So for this Freedom Summer, we got organized around local issues like infrastructure, like funding schools. And on the federal level, it's all about voting rights because voting rights is what's going to make everything else possible once you register to vote. That means police brutality. That means defund, restructure of public safety. It means all the clean drinking water, everything from clean drinking water to uh, child care credits. In fact, mm -hmm. I don't care if you want to say something about that. I was talking to Cedric Richmond last week when I was down for the Juneteenth signing. He said, do people understand that once this child tax credit, tax credit thing kicks in, if you got a young person six years old in your house or six to 17 years old, you're about to get $300 a piece for them. If mm -hmm. you got three children between six and 15, you get a check every month to help okay. take care of that young person. But not under an administration that says you don't need no money. In fact, I'm giving it to my billionaire friends. This has real world implications. Serious impact. One more Very thing, Shana, to add to this. That yep. Dr. Carr, again, when I listen to him, he inspires. We also have gerrymandering um, coming That's up right. as, as well. Like, so That's right. When people talk about the issue of gerrymandering, gerrymandering is when people draw maps, district maps, and they create maps so that it disproportionately That's represents right. folks who they feel like can help them move their agenda forward. This is 2020, we did the census. So the reason we do the census every 10 years is because after we do the census, the politicals like me, we then draw our maps for the next decade. So another issue that is gonna come after this summer on a federal, state and local level, people are gonna be drawing their maps to determine what and who they represent. So I, listening to Dr. Carr talk about how elections get stolen and. How, yeah, we're, we got that one to have to worry about, too. So when you talk mm -hmm. about the advocacy, it's so much stuff and we're always fighting. And that's because there's so many different ways and institutions and means to <laughs> oppress us that every day we that's wake right. up, we feel like we're swinging at something. That's so, right. Fighting, so always fighting, well, so. shielding something off. Always. That's, that's why we have tears and chance. Wait a minute. Bam. <laughs> white supremacy. Bam. White nationalists. Bam, laws against mm -hmm. black people like every time just shielding something to fight, right. but the fight is on, right? right. <laughs> the that's, fight why, that's why we have good. that's why we have cheers and chants so we can sing <laughs> while we fight. <laughs> right. The voice, the voice, the soundtrack of freedom, right? That's okay. right. I trained in the day, I was doing chants and cheers. Ain't no, no school like freedom school, that's all right? Because right? we gotta have a soundtrack to our freedom story. Hey, let me let me tell let me tell you. It's so funny. I know we were running out of time, but uh, um, Chuck ne Neblet out of Illinois, who's one of the original stick singers, I saw him just before COVID. We were in Selma, right at the anniversary of the bridge crossing. And we've all seen him. I mean, Isaiah knows he was an Alabama trainer. See, some of the Snick singers would come to, you know, Tennessee every year. And so I love Chuck, Chuck Neblet. He's my favorite dude in the Snick singers. Man. So I'm standing next to him. I say, man, that story on Governor Wallace, how y'all made up that song? He said, man, look. We was marching from cell to Montgomery. We got to Montgomery and I'm on the, I'm on the steps of the Capitol. I looked out and I seen all them people and I said, Wallace can't put us all in jail. It's too many people <laughs> in jail. So just like freedom schools, every, you know, young people, the soundtrack Shana is so important. We take it whatever is. is going on in the music and put our own music to it. Yeah. So he said he turned it into a doo wop, and of course Philly knows doo wop. So he was like, you know, Governor Wallace, oh yeah, you never can jail us all. Segregation by default, shoo doo ba doo ba doo. They yeah. started saying all them thousands of people. I said he can't put us all in jail. This isn't about us being. Like we're gonna be defeated. We can't be defeated. Please understand. We should be celebrating beating the beating our enemies. Yeah. <laughs> because they're, yeah. Because they're not enemies of black people, they are enemies of humanity. Please understand. Yeah. We don't yeah. mind taking the lead in this fight, but these people look, you think poor white people don't need health care? Isaiah yeah. Thomas not down there pushing legislation so that only black people get a better job. Come on now. This look. No, no, no. And this ain't about allies. You don't want your teeth fixed? No. That's a lie. <laughs> well, we, we already you know, know um, you know, Hollywood told the story of our brother Fred Hampton um in the Rainbow Coalition, how it's yeah. just it's beyond just just us, <laughs> all of us, poor people unite, disenfranchised, oppressed, marginalized groups. We yes. all need to unite 
um, you know, against this structure that's holding this power. But yes. something key while we're running out of time, I want to connect though, talking about the, you know, songs of freedom. One of my favorite songs, of course, is Sweet Honey and Rock, Ella's okay. song. But yes. what's really important for us to focus on, one line that I love in that song is, um, there's two lines. That which touched me most is that I had mm -hmm. a chance to work with people. Passing on to others that which was passed on to me. The other line in that in that um song is um to me young people come first they have mm. the courage where we failed and mm. i think that that is so important so one one of the questions before we leave that i would love for you and councilman to answer is um how do we inspire young people to become a part of this movement we know that that's where the real work is done when we study historic movements even when we talk about Freedom School and um, Freedom Summer um, and SNCC, that was all the work of young people, college age people, high school people, but then they inspire even elementary school students to go out there and fight against dogs and hoses and be jailed. Um, but all of that courage, right? Young people feel invincible. Um, so once you inspire them to do something, then they're going to go out there and do it. So how do we work, especially in this in this age where we're, we're young people are literally dying in the streets um, before they ever get to truly live life. How do we give them another alternative and, and inspire them to be a part of the Freedom Schools movement? <laughs> I see you with your thinking cap on, Doc. Councilman, did you hear that question about inspiring young people? Oh, yeah, he's I, I'll take I'll take because he's right quick before he before he jumps in. I know he's working. The um, uh -huh. I'll say this very quickly and using I'm going to use uh, Councilman member Isaiah Thomas as, as an example. It takes investment of resources. That's why we organize. You've got to give people resources. The first time we went to the farm in Tennessee for the Children's Defense Fund's headquarters at training grounds, we chartered a plane. That's because the School District of Philadelphia in partnership with City Council and our partners were able to play for that plane. 140 high school students, Isaiah and mm -hmm. them, all got on that plane. Many of them, the first flight they ever had. My man Cornelius was gripping the seats of the plane. So, to, you know, he trying to be a hard rock. North Philly, Dobbs, like, I know, boy, you ain't never been on no plane. He was, that was my <laughs> first time. <laughs> we got there. We had been there for several days and we showed an episode of Eyes on the Prize. Oh, you heard what Zeke said? Um, What's that? Doc, he said that was his first flight. He said about 70, 80 percent of them. He think that was their first flight, too. Oh, no question. And look, but Zeke, but you want to let Cornelius, you, you didn't let it show. Cornelius was hitting me. I thought he going to tear the thing on my seat thing off there. <laughs> but, but this is the thing and you remember this man we watched eyes on the prize which means you got to have resources to pay for a plane to pay for the hotels the young people were in we were in tennessee in the dark in the middle of the night watching a documentary in under this tent on the farm and i'll never forget this we watched this thing about voting rights we talking about freedom schools we had a current and then your man's marvin marvin gets up he comes in the microphone he says you know I'm watching this and we seeing how far we've come. But if we've come so far, how come we still gotta be scared to be down here in the middle of the night because of who, who's mm -hmm. out here? That's how you change. Mm -hmm. Now these are now men with families of their own changing the world. But in that moment, that light went on in the in the in the in the mind of a 16, 17 year old. And said, I just connected the 60s to now, and we got to do something about it. But it only happens when you put the resources in to take these young people out of a situation they're in just for a minute to be able to sit, think, talk to each other. And then you, now let's go back and do something about it. I'll never forget that moment, that power, just in the comment of that teenager. That mm -hmm. changed my life as a teacher. I'm like, damn, see, that's all you got to do. But somebody got to pay, pay for it. That's why you got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, somebody got to pay for it. Somebody I hear that. Well, uh, Councilman, somebody got to get our money back because we I'm already listening. paid for it with our taxes. Somebody got to get our money back to pay for it. Yes. Councilman, I know you got to hop off, so I'm going to let you speak. Um, you can speak on that or you can give the people some, some parting words. Um, yeah. That's about, again, Freedom Summer, Freedom Schools, um, and that call to action. Because I know you got to hop off. Yeah, I got to hop off in a minute. Um, if you give me, can I get two seconds i'm gonna take this vote and then i got you final can, thoughts oh yeah 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 yeah. do your thing me and dr clark can, can keep moving on this yes hey, did you hear that can i get two seconds i gotta <laughs> take this vote <laughs> do y'all understand now, I, I, I ain't gonna vote all parties are the same baby. everybody who says that is what you do right now your lips take a little imaginary needle and sew them shut 
Because <laughs> you just I heard just, why voting is important. Y'all. Can I take two seconds? I got to take this vote. What you Would you rather you? have him there or somebody who's going in mm. to vote against what you need? It's just that simple. It's just that simple, friends. It is. And that, that mindset is why I do it, Dr. Carr, because it's not easy, especially during this time with the coronavirus and the pandemic and all that. But if you could see my background, that's my yes! trainer uh, gift from my 2007 class. So I take three schools with me everywhere. I got a couple my other God. things in my office that you can see. Like, that's my Ella Baker trainer plaque. Like, I, I really, Freedom Schools means the world to me. Um, and I wish that council wasn't running late today because I could spend more time doing this. But um, I, I love my Freedom Schools family. Uh, I, I promise that we will put ourselves in a position where we will have more resources and we will be able to do this work on a larger scale because it's imperative that we are the ones uh, that put ourselves in a position to be the change that we want to see. And that's exactly how I decided to run for office. We recognize hmm. we have problems. And similar to what Dr. Carr said, this is not easy. It ain't always the funnest thing to do. But it's important that I'm at the table because I know that based on my lived experiences, I know that based on the work that I've done, I know that based on my teaching, I think I'll quote Dr. Carr. And it's not like, you know, anybody who knows Dr. Carr, you know, he's the most humble person ever. He's probably good be you know super famous and have millions yeah. of followers but he chooses yes. to do this work and this work isn't always glorifying but in the midst of the work that i do i always catch myself quoting dr carr and referencing things that was taught to me when i was in high school and when i was in college and my perspective as it relates to advocacy for african-centered pedagogy um the historical context as it relates to the things that i've been taught you know i thought it was just the norm but in the space <laughs> that i'm in it's actually very unique. So I'm happy that I'm at the table and folks can know that I'm going to continue to advocate and fight for us. And in a dream world, Shana, I would love to have a, a group of young people who we could mentor to be the next generation of elected officials, campaign managers, chiefs of staff, and things like that. Mm. Because there's not a lot of appetite for it, but it's a whole lot of power and influence in this work. And we need to train our replacement. That's right. Ooh. We we to end on that, right? We just we could just end on that a couple of minutes, but let, no, seriously, let that Thanks. resonate. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you. I appreciate. It. I got to jump off. I love y'all. Love you, brother. Love we you so love much. You, man. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, so what? So that was deep right there, right? And I think that again, that's another thing. That's another mantra that he learned that we learned right in the Freedom Schools movement. You are training your replacement. You are training your replacement, and it's so important to do that. Um, later on in the summer, we'll have some other past, present Freedom School folks on. But yes. I always brag about my first Philadelphia Freedom School experience. I did some Freedom School stuff back when I was in New York. Of but course. coming to Philadelphia was my very first experience as a college student working <laughs> with 15 and 14-year-olds training me <laughs> yes. on, on the Freedom Schools movement, where yes. those young people were now principals of schools working in government yes. we have some doing some work asha ray shout out right here with us at the center aaron shout no out question. to aaron as well um Soon. but these people went on to do phenomenal things That's but right. again when they're coming up and they're doing this work they aren't threats to me i need to retire one day right i need to sit on down it's the whole <laughs> job That's, That's what like, we want. i need to be in the struggle in a different way That's right? what we want. Shay, Shay, you know, it's interesting you say because one of the reasons why we parted with children's defense fund and we're still this we're all family this is all love yes because we understood in philadelphia that this is really a cultural grounded thing for all you people who use the word hit hotel without knowing what it means when you say train your replacement the word in egyptian is medu yawu that's an mm -hmm. ancient african concept and at one time philadelphia had over half the ella breaker trainers at the children's defense fund in the country and this was after mm -hmm. philadelphia freedom schools had left the children's defense fund they were still we training like, yes you know, our intellectual work is at the heart of what we do. That's what separates this program from every other program in the country. And we're yep. heir to that long tradition. So, Shane, I just want to thank you because Freedom Summer in Philadelphia is something very special. And we see what it can do. We have yep. to seize power. This is this ain't no this ain't no game, even though we, we play it against a game because we can master it. It's still, it ain't no game. Thank game. you, sis. You know how much we love you for doing this space every Thursday. Y'all, if y'all don't watch this, you better watch every Thursday. So, <laughs> Doc, I thank you. And as always, I thank you. 
Um, and just connected with the people, you know, Dr. Carr is our resident Baba and, and Isaiah mm -hmm. made a good point and he don't like to get, you know, these accolades and lift it up, yeah. but you know, you got to give people their flowers while they're here. Dr. Mm -hmm. Carr can be doing a million things, but we can always call on him to be in our space, to be down with freedom schools and to preach to young people and can continue to be a mentor, a trainer, a father, a mm -hmm. friend, a brother and an uncle to all of us. So yeah, shout brother. out to you, Dr. Carr. We appreciate you. you know, and I love you. you. It's the only place to be. That. Yes. Thank you, dear. It's, thank only, you. it's the only place to be. <laughs> to always follow Dr. Carr. Love so you, sis. We are coming on time. So I want to shout everybody out for watching today. Please yes. like, please share, please comment. But remember this call to action. What are like, you like, doing this Freedom Summer 2021 right. to elevate these people? You heard the things that Councilman said. You heard the things that Dr. Carr said. So take a look at yourself. What are you doing this Freedom Summer to make an impact? Thank you. We love you guys. Love appreciate you. you watching. We'll see you next Thursday. Same place, same time, 12. Peace.